Dear all, welcome at my um, channel. I recently uh, published a video on the channel for using the CMU 200 of Roden and Swartz as a generic device and specifically a spectrum analyzer and already announced that I was going to make a separate video when you use this device uh, in combination with computer software uh, for functionality as a spectrum analyzer. Um, and the reason that you might want to do that is that it actually creates quite a lot of additional functionality to the device. Stuff that is missing in there that you might have hoped to be in the device itself that becomes available once you, you, uh, you add some computer software to it. So in this video I want to review two specific pieces of, uh, of software. Um, the one is, is FreeRAS, is a piece of software by Roden and Swartz itself. And the other one is VMA, which is a, uh, which is a program developed by, a, uh, by, by, by an engineer um, who actually offers that himself via, the, via his, uh, his website. And I would like to test both pieces of software, show you what you can do with it and tell a little bit more about the, um, the background of it. So first of all, I would like to discuss with you um, why, what, what are these programs and for what would you be considering to, to use them? So I, I, I made a little overview over here. So basically, uh, FreeRAS by, by, by Roden and Swartz is, is a piece of, uh, of software that, is, um, that basically allows you to do frequency response analysis. You can analyze a device under test, a, a, a dot. And that's basically it. It's not designed for other, any other functionality than, uh, than that. And doing that, it does it in a synchronized way. So it, it synchronizes the, uh, the, 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 the signal generator as well as the, 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 the analyzer. And, and as I'll, I'll be discussing a little bit later, that is a relevant thing to take into, uh, into consideration. Um, it has a number of different functionalities in, 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 in doing the frequency response analysis. So you can have, for example, a, a second generator being, uh, being used um, uh, as, as, as a mixer. You can have um, a separate generator and... Okay, let's, um, let's kind of do that again. Now let's first take a look how we can use these the devices and what... Um, Let's first take a look how we can use these two different software programs, what, uh, what kind of functionality they, uh, they have and some other of their, uh, their aspects. Now, so FreeRAS of, um, of Roden and Swartz basically is designed to do frequency response analysis. So you can basically connect a device on the test to your, uh, to your uh, CMU and, and investigate it, um, its characteristics. It's not designed for doing anything else than basically frequency response analysis. Now, the important thing to know, it does so in a synchronized manner. So, uh, it basically synchronizes the, the signal generator part and the signal analysis part. And, and, and that is relevant. I'll go a little bit into that later on in the, in the video. Now, it has a number of different features in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, one of them is that you can actually have different CMUs or other devices of Roden and Swartz use as a generator and device use as an analyzer. There's a whole list of different devices supported for either or both of these functions depending on the software version that you have. Another thing is that you can also have two generators acting at the same time, where the second generator is acting as a, as a, as a mixer. So it's pretty sophisticated to, uh, to do that. The, uh, the program is currently in, um, in version 5.30. That's at least the latest version I was able to locate and that is a piece of software from around two, uh, 2017 or so. The original program is, is, is the first version is considerably older. Um, there is a manual, the most recent manual I was able to locate is, is, is of 2017 um, as, 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 as well. Um, that, that might be newer version but I'm not aware of any newer versions of that, uh, that software. Um, and uh, it's basically uh, free software made available for, for free by Roden and Swartz, but it's not available anymore via their website. Actually, there's a very old version still on their website, but that's probably not a version that you want to, to go and, and, and try for a variety of reasons. Um, and installing it and getting it to work, I found it very difficult. I spent quite a lot of time. I tried different computers, different operating systems, 
uh, different versions basically of, 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 uh, of, of, of visa libraries and uh, GPIB interface, etc., to connect up to my, my device. For a long time, I didn't, didn't get things going at, 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 at all. Also, considering that this was originally written for, for operating systems like Windows 95 and Windows ME and Windows 98 and, and NT and, and whatever. Um, so I didn't know whether it was going to work at, at all. Eventually I got it going at, at, at some point. I will not dwell too long upon that, but without making any change that I was aware of, at some point I got it going on one computer and then I got it going on another, where it always refused basically to, to run. So eventually I got it to, to working. Um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but I will show you in, uh, in a moment uh, some practical advices if you want to go down that, uh, that road. Now, turning now to the, uh, the VMA uh, software. So written really by an individual, uh, the latest version of that software is, uh, was released in March 2019. Actually, uh, Vitor, who makes this, uh, this software, I've been communicating with a bit, he's a very gentle uh, person. Um, he actually has much more updated version of this progress, but actually for different type of analyzers or, or, or more this type of, of, of FFT devices that you connect to a computer. Uh, he has not been updating really his CMU version uh, in the way that he did that other software. I, I can kind of understand because there's probably not such a huge demand for the CMU version and, and much more for the other type of stuff that he's, he's doing. So I, I, I think that can be well forgiven. I'm already grateful that there is a nice and a very well working version, I would say, for the, for, for the, for the CMU. But we'll, we'll, we'll see a number of, of things that come with that. Now, what do you want to, might want to use it for? Well, it's, it's, it's much more functionalities basically than, than free res. It has actually all the functionalities as a spectrum analyzer with a lot of more additional functions, sophisticated than, than what's in the, the CMU itself. You can do also do frequency responses, but it's more in a, in a rudimental ma manner and it's, it's not going to be synchronized. You can do things like, um, like drawing up a, a mask with minimum and maximum and have an error, for example, on those masks. It's, it's called trigger lock in the program. You can, for example, analyze the signal bandwidth. So what is the bandwidth within 3 dB or 6 dB or also, I think, minus 50 dB settings. And one area that is very much developed in the program is, is satellite uh, recognitions. Um, and he does that uh, via, via fingerprints by seeing what type of transponders it, it, it recognizes in the, uh, in the spectrum plot. Um, I'm not going to go on that one too, uh, too much. I think it's a very interesting functionality, but I don't have a satellite dish here with a down converter, so it doesn't make much sense for, for me right over here. But I want to point that out, that, that, that the program is very much, I think, dedicated to that type of, uh, of stuff. Now, in terms of, of, of features, it got a lot of features like presets, markers, uh, traces, whatever. We'll, we'll see a little bit in my, my demonstration later on. And in terms of visualizations, it can do waterfall plots as well as 3D plots. And I, I particularly enjoy the, uh, the waterfall plots. They're, they're very useful. I'm going to show that in a moment. Um, is there a manual? Uh, well, yes and no. There's no manual specifically for this version, but there are manuals basically for, 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 for the program that is written for other devices, uh, where actually most of the stuff is applicable here as well. So I think that's, 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 that, that's really good enough for at least what I need it for. Um, the program is free to use for a couple of uh, months. You have to, uh, to send an email to the developer and you will get a, um, a license code which is linked to your, uh, to your network card, your Mac device or a virtual Mac uh, device in, 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 in your computer. That is going to be valid, I think, for, for up to three months or so. Uh, and you can get a, a, a permanent license uh, if you donate 30 euros, I think, to, to developer, which, uh, which I think is a very fair price for, for what you, you're getting here. And installing it and getting it to work actually is not that difficult. Um, it runs on modern software. It was not that much of an issue. You have to take a couple of things into account. That is inevitable, I would say. And so let me turn to that right away. What are my advices if you want to run any of these, these programs here? Well, it will be the following. First of all, do get a GPIB hardware interface. Um, FreeRes needs that, no question about it. VMA can also run via a serial port, RS232, um, but then it cannot achieve the high refresh rate that it can achieve by, 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 by the GPIB interface. So I, I would get an interface. I mean, 
They used to be very expensive, these type of interface, but nowadays you, on, on eBay you can buy this, this key site, uh, Eglant interface, type number is here on, on, on the screen, uh, for about 100 euros or so, which I think is a, a, a decent investment for what you can, uh, can do with it. Secondly, you have to install some, uh, some software, and, and I, would, I would recommend to have the current version of Keysight Connection Expert being installed here. For free res, that is recommended. Uh, it also supports um, some stuff from National Instruments, and I think also some Roden and Swartz stuff itself, but then you probably need other hardware interfaces. Uh, VMA really requires the, the Keysight software, so you, you're gonna need to do that. Um, that. That software is basically for free and comes with the, uh, the Keysight uh, hardware. Then one thing not to, to forget is that you have to set, of course, the, the address of the, the GPIB device, but also you have to set a secondary address, which is a function group within the device. You have to do that both on the, the hardware device, uh, but also in the key side, the connection expert on the, on the computer. Now the next point on my list, and that might sound like a really weird one, for the VMA program, you have to make sure that in your Microsoft Windows regional setting, the decimal point is set to period. What do I mean by that? I live in a country where the decimal symbol is a comma, and I found out that VMA was not running properly at all. It was doing all types of things. I had no clue why things were, were, were going wrong, and after talking a little bit with the developer, it turned out to be that thing and apparently this is a way that this is implemented in the Microsoft environment, in the .NET environment, I, I don't know, but this is a pretty tough thing to, to address within the software itself. Uh, in this case, you have to do it in the operating system. That's a fairly easy thing to do, but if you don't know it, VMA is not going to run well at all, and even going to do things that you might think is not related to, to this, 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 this comma or period at all, but it is. I tell you, once you did it properly and you restart your computer, and then suddenly everything works as it as it should work. And finally, uh, I found out that it's best to, to set your computer to a more modest type of screen resolution of 1920 to 1080 and disable any screening, uh, scaling. Why am I saying that? Because these programs have kind of fixed size of windows. They're not resizable and either they get like extremely small on like a 4K uh, monitor that I'm, I'm, I'm typically using uh, here in, um, in the lab, um, but also with some types of scaling or displays, you get everything going wrong with, with the way that they display stuff, etc. So just go to the simple settings of your, um, your display and you should be uh, fine. So without spending much more time on, on, on this, I hope these advices are, are useful for people if you want to get into any of these software. They could save you a huge amount of time that I actually put into getting these things to, uh, these things to, uh, to work. Um, I, I just mentioned as well that, uh, that the VMA software was also available for a couple of other devices uh, and, and actually it's a further developed specific for the devices. I'm just showing you here a list of these other devices for which the software is available just for your information. I've not been testing them here, I don't have them, but two of them are, are these, these smaller affordable interfaces, uh, RF interface you connect to computers and there's also a, a version for, for a Siglent uh, Spectrum Analyzer uh, series. Uh, apart from the Roden and Swartz version, which works both on the CRTU and on the, the CMU uh, 200, uh, which are in the end, of course, fairly similar devices. I'm now going to test the uh, free rest software of uh, Roden and Swartz. So let's just make sure first that our connection is, is all right. And here you see the GPIP devices that are currently connected via GPIE interface. You see a couple of other instruments here in my measurement lab that are connected and, and some of them not. Um, so one important thing here basically is to make sure that that they really run. Sometimes I get here is green, but it's actually not communicating. So let me just take this CMU here. This is the one I will be using for our little experiment. I will be sending a command here sending IDN, yes, it responds, and if I ask what options this instrument has, I get to see all those options. Yeah, so I do have good communication. To be honest with you, sometimes I don't get all the devices to communicate, or sometimes not at all. It's, it's, it's kind of unstable, I haven't been able to track down exactly why that is so, um, but sometimes I can have quite a bit of issues um, for Keysight Connection Manager actually to run with all my devices. But today we're doing uh, good. 
Um, I'm going to use here the, the CMU that is on, um, on address number uh, three. And as you can also see here, maybe I should point it out for you, um, edit, that it's already secondary address one. And this is what I just showed you in a previous sheet that I've set this sub address to, uh, to the non-signaling uh, radio interface uh, part of the, the device. Okay, so um, we're good here. Um, now I'm going to start the, uh, the free rest program. So here we are. This is what you get if you, um, if you, start, the, um, if you start the program. Got a display here, of course, what's going to be the frequency response. That's after all the only function that we're having here. Um, and we'll start by first configuring the devices. So I got that right over here. So I think my devices are already configured from an earlier session. I'm selecting my, uh, my CMU. Um, I'm selecting it on interface zero, uh, address number three, and I'm going to use RF um, out here. Um, and if I click test, he will basically just do star IDN uh, to the device to get the interface string. So I'm clicking it now, yeah. So you see here, that is perfectly fine. I can do a full reset of the instrument here as well if I feel that's necessary. There's also a second generator, but for the time being, I'm going to leave that one to, uh, to none. And we got the, um, the analyzer here. Of course, we do need that always. So I can set it to CMU as well. And I put it to another RF port, RF2 in. So I'm going to connect these two ports on the device or put uh, the, the device uh, under it. You can also choose the reference oscillator and a couple of other things, testing the string here. Now we see that for the generator and for the analyzer, I can both select the CMU. Um, this is, however, a little bit depending on the, um, on the version. As I'm showing here uh, um, a page from the manual here, this is the most current version, at least the version that I could find, uh, the manual of version 5.3. And it lists uh, the, the Roden and Swartz for uh, uh, the CMU, at least, for both uh, as a source and as an, an analyzer called indicator here. However, if you go back to earlier verbiage of the program, it's not always there. Um, the CMU is added as a source only from version 4.3.1, at least that's the earliest I could track. That's of about 2013. And as an analyzer only from version 5.22, which is about 2017. Um, that's kind of funny because that, that is quite late. The CMU is a fairly old device. It was added rather late basically to, um, to the free rest program. However, in the latest manual, they do go in quite some details about uh, specific use of the CMU uh, here, um, but you might want to be aware of it. What we also see, by the way, here on this overview, apparently there's also a Mac OS version. I never came across that, certainly not anymore on the, the website of Rodin and Source. If anyone has that version, please do let me know. I will be happy to, um, happy to know. Um, also, when it comes to um, older version of FreeRes, I, I might also want to share with you my experience of getting it to, to work. I did a lot of different efforts on different computers until I finally got some versions to, to work together with the CMUs. I'm just showing you here this, uh, this sheet. Uh, I'm not going to dwell in, on, on, in, in detail on it, but I'm just going to leave it here in case it's valuable for anyone that's trying to get a version going and to see what you, uh, you need. So I'm, I'm just leaving it at, at that now. And I'm going back to the... Uh, to the live demonstration uh, now. So we properly um, configured our, uh, our both devices here. Uh, as you already might have seen, by the way, this is the modern looking uh, Roden and Swartz uh, web programs interface. The other programs look quite different, but this looks like the very recent Roden and Swartz uh, programs. Um, I see my display is set here from 100 uh, megahertz to 2700. That is you know, equal to the CMU device that I, I have. Um, I have connected the input and the, um, or, or, or the, the generator and the analyzer just with a, a straight cable or actually with a couple of management, uh, measurement leads that are, uh, are connected to each other. Um, so I'll not go in detail yet at, at, at the sweep, we'll do that in a moment, but just let me run it without any further settings here. I click run and what I get to see here is a nice straight line and that's what I've been expecting. Um, because I'm, I'm directly connecting the input and the output without a further uh, dot uh, in between uh, there. Um, well, we can see it, it, it's a fairly straight line. Uh, we're allowed to play around a little bit with the, um, uh, with the skills. One of them we can look at, at the log skill. 
So you got 100, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 2,700, sorry, 1,000, 2,000, 2,700. So we can do a, a log scale. You will see that the, the points are, of course, a little bit further in, um, in time. I'll come back to that in a moment. We, we can set this manually or connect it later to another menu. Um, we can also do the virtual scale on auto. And, and, and then we actually see that the measurement we have kind of varies between minus 9.7 or so and at the lowest point uh, minus um, 11.8 so we can we can amplify that that type of thing that's that's quite useful so it's a, well we don't always get a perfect straight line we know that both the measurement leads and the the, the instruments are not going to be perfect but i'm quite satisfied um, interestingly we do have a possibility here to normalize it and to save that normalization there's going to be some settings here save normalization and, and, and load data so so that is really great um, however in my version here I tried a couple of times I'll do a little test right here if I do a normalization I get to see normalize and any next run that I do the program crashes and disappears I'm just going to start it again so it should offer normalization but but i always get crashes if i try so okay I'm, I'm i'm just back where i was before let me just run one more straight line here is what we're supposed to be um, supposed to be getting um and before i i i i, I turn to a bit more um a more advanced type of things no let me not do that Now let's now more investigate the more advanced settings that we got here because they're going to be under the uh, the sweep menu and the uh, the sweep menu that's really where everything is happening. I I really love this type of menus. They're typical of Roden and and, and Swartz um, if they show how your stuff is configured. So we got the generator here. We got the analyzer. We can have a second generator that acts like a mixer. Um, I didn't configure it yet. I haven't been trying to do it. We can have stop and start levels in, in not only frequency but in levels so we can do level sweeping actually uh, in the device um, we can set here the generator between the frequencies we can set the, the steps here so if we're going to set this step to 50 um, we're going to see that my um, my exercise is going to be much quicker obviously um, and if i'm going to set it to uh, to one megahertz i'm going to get a very detailed uh, analysis I can do things on the analyzer. I can also set like the um, the, the the analyzer to uh, to fix or the uh, the generator here to fix. Not both of them at um, at the same time. I also have attenuation um, settings here, and that might be important if your analyzer, maybe a power meter or so, has some upper limits and you might damage the the device. So you can set an attenuation here, which is taken into account also when values are being uh, being shown. Um, but the, the last thing I wanted to point out is that when we did our line here, the line was not at zero, but was minus 10. And why is that so? Well, we can see that here because we have set the start level of the, uh, of the generator at minus 10. So we either set the start level at zero, then we will get a line at uh, zero. But what we can also do quite nice here is that, ah, it continues, we look at the relative results. Uh, and then we got the results here that, that do take that into, um, into account. Um, so that is, uh, is fairly cool. So we can, um, we can actually uh, do a lot of things. Oh, there's one thing I didn't talk about yet. That's kind of what I like as well. I just mentioned to you that these points, if I do it in, in a log plot, are fairly far apart. I can also do here the sweeping via log. And that is different than there's the display setting via log because... If I do it here, then we just got like uh, linear steps in, 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 in sweep and it just displays at the log. But I can also say that I want um, a log here and then actually I don't get steps because they will vary in, in, in megahertz. So I'm making one of 99 um, steps. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to run this one. Now in the linear thing, of course, they're going to be closer together here, my measurement values. And further apart over there. Hmm. It seems that we stopped for a moment. Hmm, I get a nasty error. This does happen. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave this into the, the, the video so you see. So sometimes the program is kind of in, in, in stable. Um, I get another error now. Hope the errors are over. So we do another run. 
no, we're not getting it to work anymore. I'm restarting it. Restarting is pretty quick. Initialization errors. Let me just see if my both devices are there. Nah, they're not there anymore. Okay, this, this is really not so nice. Now, what happened is that actually Keysight Connection Expert lost connection altogether. I, I, I must assume that is because of the interaction with the software. One more, um, one more attempt, instrument free. Try to get it alive again. Okay, I will probably need to reset the computer altogether. I'm going to leave this in the video so you see the kind of problems that you sometimes do, uh, do run into. But I'll, I'll restart and, and resume the video exercise. Okay, I'm back. I'm mildly frustrated by, by all these crashes I'm having and this is not the first time with, uh, with this software. Um, it also took Keysight Connection Expert like uh, quite a couple of minutes before it was able to find all my instruments back again. So it, it really messed up the little thing. Um, but it seems now I'm, I'm, I'm back up to running again. Let me send the command again to the, uh, to the right unit. Got the response, yeah, everything is up and fine. And let's start to start free res again and just start our um, presentation. In the meantime, I also um, installed um, a device under, under test, which is um, a bandpass uh, filter from approximately 100 to 200 megahertz. I don't know it on the top of my head, I will be showing a, um, a, a picture um, in, the, in the video. So um, let me just quickly see again if we still got everything up and running here. Yes, we got that one running, we got that one running. I'm happy. Um, so let, let's see if it still works. Yes, it does. And, and this is of course what we want to do with this type of software. Here we got our device under, um, under test. I'm, I'm going to stop it here because we're going to be only interested in the particular range of this device uh, where we might want to use it. So I'm going to put 500. Up. Up. 500 uh, hertz here. I'm going to put it back at um, 10 megahertz um, steps. Um, running it here again. And as you see here, he already automatically adapted the, the display with. Even when I don't have the auto setting, this is weird. Uh, here it still says max display is 2700. In reality, he went to connection to sweep setting, even though I don't see the little indicator here. So that, that's a bit of a weird um, thing, but we'll have to live with it. Yeah, so I got the characterization of my device. Of course, I want to see this characterization in much smaller steps. So I want to see them in, in one megahertz steps. There we go again. Now that looks more like the, the, the type of job that I would be interested in. Takes of course a little bit more time to get to the uh, to the final result. And in the meantime, I can also explain you that we have a number of options to, uh, to, to save stuff. Uh, saving the results, basically, we can save the data and, and load the data in CVS formats, I think also Excel formats and a couple of other things. Uh, we can print um, a graph to the, to the clipboard, we can print a graph to the, to the printer, um, etc. So we got quite a couple of options there. And also the overall system settings here, open and save, these are configuration files for the, uh, for the device as, um, as such. And finally, if I would like to see this device again more in, in a lock type of setting, yeah, then, then, then I see it here, huh? so we can investigate a little bit more how, uh, how the slope of these, uh, this filter is. Um, that works well, and actually I got enough steps here not to be bothered about uh, locking during the sweep uh, process, because this, uh, this looks fine enough as it is. Um, I think I covered now most of the, um, the options of this, uh, this program. Altogether, when it works, I think it's, it's, it's a very nice and, um, and flexible program. Um, it is limited to frequency response analysis only, uh, but that, 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 that is what it is. Um, what I don't like about it is the, yeah, the quite frequent crashes and, and they're all repeatable type of, of crashes that you're getting here. 
and the, the, the difficulty of getting this going. It, it costed me weeks and weeks actually to get a, a running version here and God knows if I update to another operating system or anything else that, uh, that it stops working. So I feel it's all pretty vulnerable. But, but, but when it works, I mean, it, it really does extend the options of the, the CMU quite a bit. Um, and another thing is that, that that is also kind of super interesting, and maybe I haven't emphasized this enough, is that here we got something that, as far as I understand at least, that this really locks the signal generator with the signal analyzer uh, in, in, in terms of a real um, tracking uh, generator. So it's not like doing sweeps and at the same time you're looking at the whole frequency spectrum or so. So we really got a, a synchronized type of, uh, of, 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 of tracking um, possibility here with, uh, with using FreeRes. Okay, that's it for, uh, for FreeRes right now. For the next program I'm going to talk about uh, VMA. And that's quite a bit more extensive in terms of functionality. So I'll structure my review as uh, follows. First, I'll be talking about the uh, general design and, and, and setup, um, including things like frequency settings and, um, and presets. Second, I will look at uh, visualization issues, especially related to traces. Thirdly, I will look at a couple of uh, measurement functionalities, including min, max, average, channel bandwidth and, and masks. Um, fourth, I will be talking about uh, frequency response analysis, um, and fifthly, about uh, second, uh, satellite recognition. And this is the, uh, the start screen. The first thing we will be doing basically is configuring the device. And I go to um, setup here. Um, I set the, um, the GPIB interface. That is my, my visa address here. And I set the secondary bus properly. Um, I noted actually that one of my CMUs is very slow here. And the other one is fast. Um, it must be something at the CMU uh, level, but I'm, I'm choosing the, the fast one, and that's the one over here. So let's go here. Um, and when we start, then we actually get the ID string of the device here, confirms that we're good, and we actually directly see the, the spectrum plot, which is pretty snappy. And that is, always, that is also the case, um, I assume, because we're using the, the, the GPIB interface with, um, with a serial port, which is also uh, possible. It's going to be less snappy, especially when we're going to reduce our, uh, our resolution uh, bandwidth here. Um, anyway, I'm looking now here at the, at the full scale. Um, there's some interesting stuff going on upwards of yeah, 2 gigahertz or so. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. Maybe some big Wi-Fi uh, stuff. Haven't figured it out. But anyway, we see the full spectrum of the CMU being scanned here and shown at the resolution bandwidth of, uh, of 1 megahertz. Um, let's first look a little bit at how we do um, frequency settings. It's got the common method, of course, of start and end or of center and, um, and spam. Um, and if you type any of these, then a... Um, then an interaction box will, uh, will pop up. We can uh, set here uh, 100 megahertz or kilohertz. Actually, the kilohertz is with, uh, with a capital K. I hope in the next revision of the software it will be a, a small K as it uh, is should. That's, of course, a, a detail only. And we, we can change uh, here to any setting. Um, one of the nice things is actually we can save settings over here. So what we can do basically is um, is to have start and, uh, start and stop settings. Um, actually, we, we can put them all here in, um, in, in the setup tab in, 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 in presets. We can give them a name, a start and end. There's also um, a local oscillator. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that in, um, in a moment, not right, uh, right now. And by doing that, we can easily switch to, for example, the um, GSM band that I've been looking at um, before, or we can look at the ISM band, yeah, there's currently no device of mine that is uh, close by and, 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 and being transmitting on those, uh, those frequencies. Uh, although we saw a little bit of stuff going on in one of them. That was the, uh, that was the other one. Yeah, there are some weak, uh, some weak signals uh, here. Um, all fine, and, and actually I will now turn to the, to the DAP um, Band and I will reduce my resolution bandwidth a little bit to 100 kilohertz. Okay, that's 
that's better. So, so DAP is basically digital radio broadcast. This is digital radio stations here in the area where I live. And I happen to know there are a couple of channels around uh, here. I made a little overview. So we should see signals on DAP channel 7C, which is 192. So I'm moving my cursor here. And as you see here at mouse position, huh, we got our cursor thing and we got it over here, 192. So that's, that's the channel we're seeing here. And we see a couple of other ones. And, and, and here you already see the, the relative power of having this type of, um, of, of waterfall or spectrogram um, display. Um, I really like it. It makes even weak signals well identifiable. So, uh, so I like the graphics uh, type of settings. But sticking for a moment basically to, to what we were looking right, uh, right here with settings, I first want to talk about the markers. So you can uh, set markers it's a bit of a different way than the typical spectrum analyzer. So what you do here is that you click on one of the marker settings. You click on the screen and you get marker one. You click another time on the screen, you get marker two. Then you got your delta information and the values at these, uh, these markers. And you can also decide going over here basically to use these markers as new definition for start and stop. So once I click here, yeah, then I get to see just the area that I selected, which is one of the, the DAP channels. Now, I want to move on to the, uh, the visualization of the, the results. And we got that here in, in traces. There's the, uh, the live trace that we're looking at um, right now. And we can write that to a, um, to a memory. Um, we can look at the, um, the minimum signal that was received. And we can reset that. And we can look at the maximum signal. We can reset it well, and you see the maximum being built up. Um, don't want to dwell too much over that. And we can look at the average signal, which I guess is the most useful out of these, uh, these type of, uh, of function. And with this average, we can also decide how many counts are basically being used to calculate this average on. Then, rather interesting, we also have the possibility for math traces here. Um, so we can have a mass. Uh, a math here, and I'm actually turning it on. Let, let's first look at the configuration. Now, currently, the math channel is being defined as taking the life and subtract from it 6 dB. Now, this is what I think what we just quickly saw, just a 6 dB subtraction. Okay. More interesting, perhaps, is taking the mask and subtract the average. So we're going to see instantaneous differences. Um, let me just take this away. So I'm going to put that on. And we're going to see something appearing around the 0 dB. It's quite easy to reconfigure the screen, as you see here, both on the top side and the, 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 the bottom side. Um, so now we're actually seeing the difference between the, the current sweep and the last average of the last 10 sweeps. I can also put this like at, uh, at 30 or so. Oh, 40, there we go. Now we see that the 40 still has to be calculated. And after we had about 40 runs, then we got a, a good average. Uh, and now we're basically seeing the, uh, the differences in um, a signal. So that's quite a nice, um, a nice functionality, math. We got something called, uh, called fade. And there actually each value fades away after it um, disappears into a different color. But by far, I think the most useful thing that we got here is 3D traces. And actually here we get to see the signal waveform over time. Um, in a 3D type of, um, of diagram. And of course, depending a little bit on, on what type of the spectrum that we, we're, we're looking at, this is useful. So I was just thinking about maybe just looking at the GSM spectrum again. Let me just reset the whole thing. And go back to 3D view. Yeah, and here we got an interesting spectrum diagram um, and we can influence that basically not only by taking other values here on the um, on the axis, but we also have some visualization things where we can uh, turn it around or, or another uh, direction basically. So yeah, this can be a really useful tool if you're looking at um, dynamic type of uh, signals. Um, the shading possible, so makes it um, a solid block, etc. cetera. Uh, you can do something with overlay. I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but altogether I would say that the um, the visualization techniques that are being employed here are, um, are very good. 
covering one or two more, more topics. Of course, we got our RF input as well. So you can see here, this is specifically designed for the CMU. Huh? I can change here to, uh, to other RF channels, basically, uh, for my, uh, my observations. I would now like to demonstrate something about the, uh, the measurement section. I will start with min, max, average and with, uh, with bandwidth. So to do that, I've created a, uh, a tone at 500 megahertz with an external oscillator. I'm just going to turn it on now. And, and so there we have our, uh, our tone. Um, this is kind of, let's assume, a, a perfect tone. So actually what we're seeing here, the width here, is the result of the uh, the resolution bandwidth, not the real tone. So if I turn that to 200 kilohertz, it's going to get wider. And if it's going to turn to 100 kilohertz, it's, it's, it's going to be more narrow. Um, but for the sake of this experiment, I think it's, it's fine what I'm doing. Um, so here we get to see the, the, the minimum, the maximum and the average of whatever it's on, on display now in the part over here. And we can also accompany this with, uh, with horizontal lines, which is uh, convenient. Um, a step further, a bit more sophisticated, is um, bandwidth measurements on this uh, signal because we got a built-in functionality that we can actually see what the 3dB bandwidth is, so the bandwidth between the 3dB points of this signal here. So I activate it and I get to see that it's actually 0.104 megahertz. And again, if I make this signal a bit broader, and of course, I'm fooling you a little bit because I'm not changing the signal. I'm just changing the way it's displayed here because of the resolution bandwidth. Uh, we get to see uh, something extra here. It, it gets a wider signal. And we can do the same thing here also for 6 dB points um, and even minus 60. Although I don't think that's going to make sense here. Yeah, he's even given a warning here because there is no minus 60. I'm already down all the way in my, uh, in my noise. Um, but I think this is... Um, yeah, this is a nice function. You can also set the minimum seek distance when you're dealing with, with signals of, of, of various width. I've come across some issues with, 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 with very narrow signals or very low values of uh, resolution bandwidth, uh, but I think overall this is a uh, useful functionality. So the, the next uh, measurement function I want to talk to you about is um, masking or what is called uh, trigger in the context of this, uh, this program. So what are we actually talking about is the ability to create a mask and to see when our signal is deviating from that mask. So here I got again the uh, uh, a signal at uh, 500 uh, megahertz created by an external signal uh, generator. So I can play with it a little bit in a moment. I go to the trigger, lo trigger log tab here. I open the trigger mask editor and I get to see the waveform that I have. And now I can do two things using my left hand mouse button I can set a maximum level for my warnings yeah, there we go and with my right hand mouse let me try that I'm going to set a, a minimum I hope I did it well use mask spectrum and here we go, we see status is being okay. But now, should I try to increase the level of my signal, and I'm going to my signal generator now, and I'm going to make the signal stronger and stronger. And then we see an alarm maximum. Huh? So we, we go over the value. Now I'm making the signal weaker again, and I'm fine, I'm within the mask. And if I go below here, I get an alarm. Yeah, that's already happening where the, where the noise is. Um, alarm minimum. And I'm going to try to bring my signal back where it originally was. And now the state is, is okay. So really this allows you for a warning when a signal gets out of a predefined type of, uh, of uh, mask. And there's even a ability to get external warnings on, um, on this. I think the trigger lock email settings is right over here so you can actually set an email address and receive a email on trigger alarm so if you might have it running somewhere in in the background uh, when a signal disappears or gets too uh, uh, too strong um, you will need to use like a regular smtp server without any encryption so you might want to set up something uh, a special email address for that uh, 
and, and I understand also the, the information in the registry of your window computer is going to be there unencrypted. So you really want to create a separate email address for this where you don't take any security risk. But I, I can think of situations where, where this actually might come in quite useful. So, so another um, yeah, good piece of, um, of functionality that is being built into this uh, program. Now the next function I would like to discuss with you is the option here for the tracking generator. Because this program also in a bit of a rudimentary way uses the ability to have a signal generator in the CMU and then actually measure what we are, uh, we're getting back. But it works a little bit different as from free rest that we saw um, earlier in this, this video. So what happens here is basically best demonstrated if we choose like the same RF input and RF output for the tracking generator and for the, um, um, and for the analyzer and just simply put it on running. And what we see happening now, and I'm going to look at the maximum values, is that we're getting back basically the, the value that was sent out by, uh, by the device. Um, kind of surprisingly, I get quite a lot of drops here. I don't know what it is. I tried with different CMUs. Um, no explanation, there might be something wrong. What we also see here interesting here is this higher harmonics going on, like the first harmonic. This is because the tracking generator is not synchronized, but it's actually scanning the whole spectrum at the whole time. So that's a bit of a different implementation than in, 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 in free res. But I'll show you in a moment that, that still, if you don't have any other tools, this can still be useful for basically characterizing devices. But now again, we're still looking at the same port. We're not yet characterizing any device. Um, and even though we have this strange drops going on, um, I'm kind of confident if we let this run for, uh, for a while um, and we have the maximum over number of different sweeps, etc., we get to a quite, um, um, a quite straight spectrum. So, uh, so let's just run for a moment and I'll put the video in uh, fast forward. Okay, I will be uh, stopping this, uh, this process. Now this is, I guess, a matter of statistics until we get a perfectly straight line. Again, I don't know exactly why the, why the lower values exactly uh, come from. Might be pure statistic, it might be, I mean, he didn't touch this one for, for free sweeps, but then again, he might touch it the next time. That's, that's the characteristics of, uh, <laughs> of, of probabilistic processes, stochastic processes in statistics. Um, but never mind. I mean, the, the point I think that we want to get to here is that we want to characterize a, a dot, of course, not the input and output of the same port. So we'll do that basically by now changing the RF input to RF2. Um, so there is a, a bandpass filter again connected uh, between the two of them. Um, I want to close here the maximum, but actually that's only happening if the system is running. Only then the, uh, the close function does uh, something. So now starting the process with uh, the dot um, engaged. I'm changing to input RF2. I'm going to clear the signal and I'm going to turn the tracking generator on. And now basically the tracking generator should be tracking here on the screen. I'm not really seeing much yet, but it should come up basically when the signal gets strong enough for the, uh, the bandpass filter. So let's have a bit of, um, of patience. Yes, I see the uh, signal already uh, growing. Um, also here it's, it's jumping up and down a little bit. So, so just I'll put it on fast forward and, and, and let it do a number of, uh, of sweeps. Okay, I think I'm uh, stopping the, the, the process um, here. Um, eventually, I think we got a, a pretty nice characterization of, uh, of our device here on, on the screen of our dot. Um, it took really quite a few uh, sweeps and the sweeps are quite, uh, quite slow. Uh, so you must be really patient, but, um, and, and I would say that the uh, free rest program would be really the preferred choice if you want to do any such, uh, such frequency response measurement with a, a device on the test. Um, but if this is the only tool that you have available for whatever reason, um, it's just good to know that um, it is possible to, to do it using this, uh, this approach. A review of VMA would not be complete if we don't talk about the probably most important reason why this program was, 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 was written in the first place. And this is about um, observation of satellite uh, signals. So there's actually quite a bit in the program that is dedicated to, to that. So we can see that if we're here in the measurement section, there's a part called transponders. Um, if we go to the setup, there's something about satellite identification here. Um, there's something about uh, GPS uh, location. Now, that's not only for satellite, I would say. 
and there's also this local oscillator. So what is this all about basically? This is about using this program in combination with a, 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 a satellite dish and then being able to recognize the, the transponders, the different uh, carriers on which uh, the, the satellite is, uh, is broadcasting and identifying the satellite by uh, what we could see as a kind of a fingerprint of, um, of these different transponders there. So if you activate this function here, even though I must say right away that, uh, that we're not actually seeing any satellite signals here, um, we see attempts here um, to, find, um, to find carriers and to, to identify them. Now the fact that they're all here in, in red means they're not identified. We're not seeing satellites because I don't have a satellite dish here. Um, and we need a satellite dish to first of all receive the satellite signal strong enough, but secondly also to down convert them in the um, in the satellite dish that will basically be a local oscillator bringing it from the KU band so over 10 gigahertz basically down and this is precisely what this local oscillator frequency is about so if we would have a local oscillator of uh, 9750 megahertz and I'm making up this value I don't know if it's entirely correct basically um, then basically the program would, 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 would know how it's Dow converted. We see it reflected here. We don't see it reflected here, but that might be still addressed in a future version of the program. Um, and and then anyway, those different satellites could be uh, recognized in principle. Um, we can also use the average tray for that and, and have a number of other settings here. And their transponders list, actually there's a lot of transponders list already uh, stored on the computer that come with the program that have these kind of footprints of these uh, these satellites uh, fingerprints. Um, so so this is a rather interesting part, and and I know this is uh, this is very uh, dear to the developer of this software. Um, but we're not going to test it here today because I don't have a, a satellite dish. Instead, I will show you one or two pictures from um, from the manual of of the program uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea what you would see if you would actually properly recognize a, uh, a satellite using this, uh, this software. So finishing now with my, uh, my verdict of the two uh, programs. So in combination with uh, the CMU of Roden and Swartz, uh, I find that uh, FreeRAS is a very powerful frequency response analysis. Um, it can only do that, it's very much limited to that specific functionality, but it's very sophisticated at doing so. However, it's hard to get working um, I spend a lot of time actually getting a functioning <laughs> version up and running on, on, on my computers here and some functionalities uh, like normalization result in consistent uh, crashes and I think other people have been writing about that on the internet as, uh, as well. Turning now to VMA, um, it's a tool that I got to like very much actually when playing with it. It's a, a very powerful generic uh, spectrum analyzer tool offering a lot of things that the CMU doesn't have by itself. It got great visualization features. It also got a number of useful measurement options, including the, the, the bandwidth of, of, of a channel, for example, and the, uh, the masking uh, triggering tool that we got here. It's specifically interesting for those people that are interested in measuring stuff coming from, uh, from satellites. And it is a, a stable program in how it uh, runs. Um, however, the frequency response analysis that it, it, it has is differently interpreted than the, uh, than the one in free res and I would say less, less attractive. I would turn to free res if, if that is really the thing that you want to be uh, doing. But overall, I think these two programs are, are complementary and, and, and a great way basically to, you know, to put new life into a CMU, a, uh, what is it, 20 years old instrument or so, and, and providing it with a number of, um, of, 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 of modern tools and functionalities. I hope you like this uh, video and um, hope to see you on my uh, channel soon.